Okay, we can restart now. So I was talking about uh, uh, consequences of this uh, fact that the Gaussian uh, distribution is a differential entropy maximizer and one consequence is uh, theorem 21 here that says the following there is a relation between the differential entropy and uh, minimum mean square error estimation so let's read the theorem and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, what it means right so we have two random variables x and y they are jointly distributed according to a joint distribution and then basically a typical problem in uh, uh, statistical signal processing is to estimate x by observing y. So we do it through a function that is called an estimator. So an estimator x hat of y is a function that tries to guess the value of x given the value of y. And we define the mean square error for this estimator as the expectation of the square error which is simply the square of the difference. Hmm? Uh, so this is called the mean square error, or MSE, mean square error. And of course, if we pick uh, this function x hat in order to minimize the mean square error, we talk about minimum mean square error estimation, or MMSE hmm? estimation. And this uh, theorem says that uh, for any estimator, so including the minimum mean square error estimator, the mean square error is larger than 1 over 2 pi e times 2 raised to 2 times the conditional differential entropy of s given y. And equality on this lower bound is obtained only if x is Gaussian and uh, x hat is um, the uh, Conditional mean. Uh, conditional mean uh, estimator is, in general, is the minimum mean square error estimator, in general. So, here I want to just open a little parenthesis. Let's go at the end of this theorem, here, and add a page, because I want to say the following thing. Uh, for those of you who have not attended my course on, of last semester, those of you who have attended must know these things very well, but the one who have not attended, maybe it's better to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, uh, recap a few things. So in general, I say we have, the problem is we have two jointly distributed random variables with a, a joint PDF, and we want to infer x from y, so we construct a function x hat of y, and we want to minimize the MSE. So among all the possible functions, uh, there is one particular function, let's call it phi of y equal to expectation of x given y. Notice that uh, a conditional expectation is always a function of the conditioning variable. Huh? So a conditional expectation means, just uh, to remember, uh, is this. Now if you integrate with respect to x, so the only variable here is the argument y, because you are summing over x. Okay, so that's a function of y. So it turns out that uh, the there is a theorem that is called the orthogonality principle that says that uh, in order to minimize the mean square error, the condition is that the error, so x minus x hat of y, must be orthogonal to the observation. 
Right? In fact, to orthogonal to any function of the observation. So it has to satisfy the following. For any function g of y, this must be zero. This can be seen from the following picture. Imagine that uh, instead of random variables, we had to do with points in a space. And in fact, it turns out the analogy is precise. So uh, random variables with final second moment for, uh, with the correct definition of inner product as the inner product of x and y is uh, expectation of x times y. Uh, so this is uh, like a we the way we define the inner product x, y in this space of random variables, they form a Hilbert space. So they have the same geometric, geometric property of uh, you know, standard uh, vector spaces with an inner product, like uh, the, the one that we have a uh, normal intuition, like for example, Rn. Huh? So I can visualize the problem as follows. We have a point in this space, which is our random variable x, and then we have a sort of subspace of all the possible functions of the observation y. So those are all possible okay and it turns out that uh, in order to minimize the mean square error you have basically to find the orthogonal projection. So you have to find uh, the function x uh, actually, let's call it phi of y, this special function, such that the error vector is perpendicular to all the space of all functions of x. Hmm? This minimizes the means. This is called the orthogonality principle, and it holds for all problems that have to do with minimizing uh, uh, square error um, when in the space over which you are doing this operation is an uh, inner product space, and in, in particular is a Hilbert space. So it turns out that the uh, conditional expectation has this property. Let's check. Uh, uh, I want to check that if I take for x hat, I take my special function psi of y, conditional expectation, and this is a generic y. Uh, so well, this is I just write it down explicitly, and then I use what is called the, the, the theorem of iterated expectation. It says that the expectation is equal to the expectation of the conditional expectation. In other words, I can write this outer expectation. Uh, this one, let me mark this in blue, so you we distinguish between inner and outer. I write the blue outer expectation as expectation of a conditional expectation. So now I put here the red stuff, x minus this. Huh? Conditioning on y and then expectation. So you see I have uh, written the expectation, the blue expectation as the expectation of a conditional expectation where I have introduced this conditioning. And now whatever is a function of y in the inner expectation, this one, operates like a constant. So we have going on, we have the outer expectation, then this inner expectation, now the product, this conditional expectation is a function of y. This is a function of y. So they operate like a constant. The expectation of a constant is the constant itself. So this becomes simply expectation of x, g, y, given y, minus expectation of x, given y, g, y. And now I see here that again this is a constant with respect to y, so it can filter out the the, the conditional expectation. So we have which is obviously zero for any g of y. Huh? 
So the, the, this proves the orthogonality principle, principle plus the theorem of iterated expectation proves that the conditional expectation of x given y is the MMSC estimator of x given the observation y. Hmm? Fine. So, um, so how do we prove this? Um, well, we define the conditional variance of x given y, I define it in this way, as you see, uh, it's conditional variance because uh, uh, this is the conditional mean, the so conditional expectation, and this is the definition of variance. It's just uh, the expectation of uh, the square difference between a variable and its mean, but then this is conditional mean, and I use its condition here. So this is called conditional variance of x given y. Right? And uh, I also define the... Uh, conditional distribution of x given y and the differential entropy of this conditional distribution in this way. So this is also a function of y, no? because you fix y and then this is a distribution with respect to x and then you integrate and you get the differential entropy. Now by definition, if I take an outer expectation of these, of these things, so here, well that's the conditional uh, the conditional uh, differential entropy that uh, given by this formula. And now we can write the following. We have for any, uh, for any function of the observation, we know by what I said before that uh, this mean square error is less or equal than the minimum mean square error when I replace x hat of y with a conditional expectation of x even y. Then I use the theorem of iterated expectation, I write this expectation as expectation of the conditional expectation. So this is simply expectation of what I have defined before as conditional variance of x given y. Right? But now I use the fact that uh, uh, given a, a variable with a certain variance, right? The, the conditional, uh, sorry, the, the differential entropy is maximized by a Gaussian distribution. So in other words, if I have a variable x with given variance sigma x of y, then we know that one half logarithm of 2 pi e times this is greater or equal than the differential entropy of the conditional distribution of x given y for fixed y. Okay? This is simply because this is the variance of this distribution and we know that for all the distribution with fixed variance the Gaussian differential entropy is the largest. Okay, so this means that uh, this term for every fixed y is always less or equal, no, greater or equal than this term for fixed y. And then, of course, the, expect the outer expectation is also satisfies the, the, uh, uh, the inequality, huh? because if something is true for every y, when you take the mean, it's always the inequality remains true. Huh? Uh, by the way, here there should be a 2 because I use logarithm base 2, and in fact I wrote the theorem with a 2 here, so that's a typo. You can note down, I will correct it. Uh, at this point, uh, we have that, uh, okay, that's again 2. Now I use the fact that the exponential is a convex function, and so if I bring this expectation inside, I have Jensen's inequality that tells me that the expectation of the function is less or equal than the function of the expectation. So in other words, the expectation of the function is less or equal than the function of the expectation. Huh? So I get uh, eventually my lower bound. And then you can check that uh, when, when the, uh, uh, this, e, this equality uh, when, when, when uh, C holds with equality, 
uh, well, when 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 X is uh, when X is uh, is Gaussian, uh, and and uh, so all these uh, chain of inequalities uh, hold with uh, with equalities. So we have also the second state. That's easy to check. Okay, so we have also talked about the minimum mean square error. Other related results is this corollary that uh, if we have two random vectors, xn, ym, not necessarily the same dimension, uh, and we define the conditional mean of xn given ym, so the minimum mean square error estimator of x given y, and the corresponding error, uh, we can define the covariance of the error, so I, I call it sigma e, right? and then I have this uh, um, inequality that uh, you can check very simply. It follows from the previous uh, theorem, in fact this is a corollary, that the conditional entropy of a uh, vector x given vector y is less or equal than one half logarithm of 2 pi e to the n times determinant of the covariance estimation error. Okay, So uh, this is also a useful result. Sometimes we need to upper bound this term, and but maybe the joint distribution of x and y is complicated, but maybe we can actually calculate this uh, minimum mean square uh, covariance error, right? And uh, and it turns out that uh, we get an upper bound. In fact, this would be the best upper bound. Uh, it turns out that if I have a worse estimator that is not the conditional mean, it's something else, uh, well, then uh, the error will be bigger, and it turns out that the determinant of the covariance matrix of the error is larger, so here I can also get a, a worse, um, say, a looser uh, bound by using, you know, some estimation error that is not the minimum mean square error, but is a suboptimal estimate. So in other words, I can upper bound this differential entropy by plugging in here a suboptimal estimator that maybe is an estimator for which I can compute the, in a simple way, this uh, error covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. So this, prove it as a homework, is not difficult as a corollary of the previous theorem. Uh, talking a little bit more about uh, minimum mean square error estimation, since uh, we are talking about this and we are talking about Gaussian random vectors, uh, something that uh, most of you should know because it's a standard material from uh, signal processing, statistical signal processing and estimation theory, is that if we have uh, two jointly zero mean Gaussian vector, again x and y, hmm, we have an explicit formula for the minimum mean square error estimator, which is this one. Is simply, uh, so we define the covariance of x, the covariance matrix of y, and the cross covariance x, y, and of course y, x is the x, y transpose, and it turns out that the conditional mean estimator for jointly Gaussian vector is a linear function, and the transformation is just the product of uh, the cross covariance sigma xy times the covariance of the observation inverse sigma y inverse. And we also have an explicit formula for the error covariance. So this is very useful uh, because sometimes you know uh, we uh, we need this this error covariance and we have an explicit formula. So just for fun, uh, if we particularize everything, everything written here for n equal to m equal to 1, so we have a univariate Gaussians, it turns out that for univariate Gaussians, the conditional entropy of x given y is simply, one, is simply the, uh, the differential entropy of the error. Huh? 
and you can uh, uh, you can uh, basically uh, see it in this way uh, very quickly. Uh, you can write uh, h of x given y is equal to you know we can put here any function of y because uh, the differential entropy is invariant by translation. When you condition on y, uh, any function of y is a, act as a constant. So in particular, we can use the conditional expectation, which is a function of y. Okay? And it turns out that when these, uh, um, in the special case of x and y jointly Gaussian, as you can see from here, the covariance but first of all, the error is also Gaussian, and the covariance of the error does not depend on y. Although this is a conditional error, because this is a function of y, you see here, this is, those are all constants. So it means that for the special case of Gaussians, the conditioning on y disappears, so we can remove the conditioning. Otherwise, in general, we get an upper bound. right? And so what we have here, we have simply, this is simply the error variable. Let's call it e. The error variable is Gaussian with that covariance, and then we get this formula, okay? Where this is simply the covariance of the error, written explicitly. You take this formula, you replace uh, just uh, sigma becomes sigma x squared. This is uh, simply sigma xy two times. They commute because it's their scalar divided by sigma y squared, right? And then you multiply out and you have this expression. Okay, so they are the same. This is like the vector, the matrix general form. This is like the uh, the scalar case. Huh? Okay, so this ends uh, our little overview of uh, differential entropy and continuous random variables with some emphasis on Gaussian random variables and Gaussian random vectors and some additional information on estimation theory, minimum mean square error, and the conditional mean estimator, okay? And its relation with uh, the differential entropy. Uh, Hopefully, in the second part of the course, when we go to more advanced topics, uh, we will also look at a very interesting relation between MMSC, minimum mean square error, and mutual information, which is a much more fundamental relation. Uh, it's called the MMCI identity, and uh, that's a relatively recent result that appears maybe less than 10 years ago. Uh, and it actually brings a lot of interesting things. But uh, I want to treat this uh, maybe later as one of the advanced topics. Okay, so now I want to introduce the um, Gaussian channels. And in order to do this, we, have, uh, we need a step. The step is to go from discrete to continuous. So, so far, we have treated discrete random variables with defined entropy. We have a theorem for discrete memoryless channels. What happens when we go to continuous alphabets? So, when uh, we consider channels that have an input that lives in a continuous uh, space, for example, a real number, and an output that also lives in a continuous space, for example, another real number, and the transition probabilistic relation between input and output in the channel is described by a conditional density rather than a conditional probability mass function. Mm -hmm. So, of course, when we deal with continuous random variables, many topics, many, many tools that we have used so far, for example, typicality, uh, do not really apply, right? Because in typicality, we have to count now we define typical sequences are those sequences that uh, have a certain uh, empirical frequency of the symbols. Now, if for, for continuous values, uh, well, uh, the same symbol will never appear un unless you have like an infinite uh, precision. Uh, and what is the probability of uh, that a, a continuous random variable generated twice exactly the same number with infinite decimals, right? Um, so. Clearly, we have to be a bit careful. But uh, basically, what happens is that what we can do is uh, 
we can uh, basically um, consider yeah actually this is a mistake this uh, this slide was not supposed to be here so I will erase it is a residual of the past because I have done some edits here it is okay so basically what we do we we consider the following uh, so we consider if we have if nature give us for example uh, a continuous alphabet channel we basically can play the following game we play the the game of discretization we can consider uh, constellations of discrete points i call it p subset of x right and a partition of the of the output so uh, uh, this q is a partition what is a partition is a uh, say division in disjoint sets like essentially a quantization right if you have a, for example a continuous set for example a line right and you can quantize the line into into segments and then associate symbols for each of the segments so if your y say is here well you will output the corresponding symbol so we define uh, x sub p as a discrete this, this set a random variable that takes uh, values in this discrete set of points inside the alphabet x and we dis, uh, we define uh, y sub q as the quantized version of y so they, they will take the index of the q of, of the s quantization cell so if y belongs to the quantization cell number s then uh, uh, yq is equal to s and clearly there is a Markov chain because we can go from the set of discrete points to x then uh, uh, the channel goes from x to y then uh, uh, the, the quantizer at the output goes from y to yq and by the, pro the data processing equality we have that uh, the multiple information between the discretized variables uh, xp and yq is all for any this is true for any p and Q uh, is, uh, is uh, we have that uh, the mutual information of the discretized variables is less or equal than uh, the mutual information of the original variables, and in 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 addition, it's not difficult to see uh, through a supremization argument that if I take the soup over all possible uh, input constellations and output quantizations. Well, this will actually be equal to the mutual information. Huh? So then the, we can somehow generalize our uh, results for discrete memorized channels through the following uh, argument. Huh? You, you fix P and Q, you get the capacity of the corresponding discretized channel, right? Then you repeat this for all possible P and Q, and you get the supremum over all possible P and Q. This will be the capacity of the actual um, continuous alphabet chain. So it is uh, something that uh, I will not go too much into the details. It's a little tedious. If you want a rigorous argument, you can find it, for example, in the book of Gallagher. It has a, a well done rigorous argument for this. But this is more or less the philosophy for which we can do this jump and say, okay, we have proven these uh, results for the uh, DMCs, and now we use basically the same formula also for memoryless continuous uh, alphabet channels. And therefore, we can just state here the, uh, the capacity cost function for memoryless continuous alphabet channels which is essentially has the same uh, formula uh, that we already know, simply the, uh, is the maximum of the mutual information, which is perfectly well defined for continuous variables, where the maximization is over all input distributions. So Px is an input, say, PDF, such that the uh, cost constraint is satisfied. Okay, so the only difficulty here when we deal with the PDFs and continuous uh, alphabets is that, for example, an algorithm like a Black Hat Arimoto algorithm wouldn't work. 
uh, at least wouldn't work immediately because in the Black Hat Arimoto algorithm, we explicitly use the fact that uh, we are optimizing with respect to a finite dimensional probability vector. But here we are optimizing with respect to a density. So we are optimizing with respect to the space of, you know, densities of, of, of the input, which could be, is in fact, an infinite dimensional space of functions. So the optimization of in, in this case is much harder in general. So when we deal with the Gaussian case, with the Gaussian channel, it turns out that we can do this optimization explicitly through simple inequalities. And there, the fact that the Gaussian distribution maximizes the differential entropy plays a fundamental role. But in general, if you have a non-Gaussian continuous channel, uh, there is another set of much more complicated algorithms that uh, can get the somehow approach the, the optimal solution, but it is a much more difficult problem conceptually than you know applying the Black Hat Arimoto algorithm. So of course one always talking about uh, how you do it. Uh, a possibility is also to do exactly what I wrote here. You take a discrete set of points, sufficiently dense but discrete. Uh, in the input, you guess a sufficiently dense quantizer for the output, and then you reduce your original channel to a discrete memoryless channel, and for which, on top of that, you can apply the Blehat Arimoto algorithm. But of course, you are never sure that uh, the discretization you have chosen is, uh, is sufficiently close to, to the optimum. So you have to do it many times and try to approach and see if you can essentially reach a sort of uh, this, this supremum and you know there is a, unless you have other methods so like a, an upper bound and then you say how close you are to the upper bound in order to stop then you never know how to stop so again is not uh, in general is not such an easy problem okay so at this point uh, we are ready to talk about the Gaussian channel, which is the last uh, thing I want to say in this chapter. And uh, I will start by introducing... Um, no, actually no, let's do it like this. Uh, I'm going to stop here and then we do the third part. Uh, and in the live sessions, I want to talk more in details about the relation between this information theoretic model and the physical layer communication models that we are used to see in communication theory and probably you have seen in some course in digital communication before. Uh, this requires, a, I don't want to do a whole course in COM theory because otherwise this would be a COM theory course, but it is interesting to put this model in relation to the so-called waveform channels that we deal in communication theory, uh, because I know that when you have studied uh, undergraduate communications, you probably have seen a lot of sine and cosines and modulated carriers and demodulators and filters amplifiers, antennas, and things like this, and now you see just this. Right? And, and what is the relationship between this simple model and all these terrible things that you have seen with the QPSK, QMA, uh, QAM, uh, strange constellations, uh, strange frequency modulations. Okay, the relation is uh, kind of neat, uh, and um, it goes through the Shannon sampling theorem, and uh, it turns out that uh, this model is uh, general enough to represent a lot of the models dealt with by uh, COM theory, at least in a rather idealized um, scenario. But uh, yeah, I will make this link in the live session because it's more like a qualitative uh, addendum to, uh, to the lecture. So we stop here and in the third part we deal with the capacity of the Gaussian channels.